Hello everyone, welcome to this second outing with my next guest, Dr Zoe Hodson, who has a special interest in, a GP, a special interest in menopause. Zoe's joining me again because we've got, we've got a conversation we'd like to have with you, haven't we Zoe? We've got a conversation we'd like we to have, have with people. We've had some musings. Somewhere. We've had some musings about <laughs> things and we thought why keep it to ourselves? So we're here for a menopause conversation, but a menopause conversation with a twist, which is we want to, to pose a question, is it time for change? And we're going to get into what we mean about that. But midlife menopause, it can be a bit of a hairy time for people, uh, a lot of change, a lot to try and unpack or get into. And so we wanted to open up a conversation around that in the context of maybe some of the things we might be leaning on, relying on um, during this time for change. But actually, is it time for change? So Zoe, what do you what do you understand about that? And in the context of what we've been talking to, if you wanted to tell the people watching watching this, where, where are we going to go with our conversation today? So this is from, I suppose, lots of years working in general practice and then focusing more on menopause and seeing, particularly going through perimenopause, um, this sort of itchy, scratchy this doesn't feel right for me anymore. And that can encompass not only your symptoms, um, but behaviors that you've relied on that have become habit and that aren't necessarily giving you the same we'll use the word pleasure um, distraction the same benefits probably the wrong word but they're just not sitting very well with you your body is fighting them um, and we know as I say particularly we focused on alcohol this month so we know that perimenopause, menopause and alcohol really don't sit well together because of the physiological changes. And I speak to so many people that in the clinic and outside of the clinic and they think, what, what are the, my, we'll use alcohol again, my alcohol habits are no longer suiting me and I'm not quite sure how to start to address this. In the middle of a vulnerable time, Personally, globally, there's a lot going on in the world. Perimenopause can be a, a very psychologically vulnerable time. And we both love the book Second Spring that talks a lot about this. So it was to look at, um, and again, I know you work in this field, how you would approach change. Yes, exactly. And it's, that's such a good, a good point because you're, you're right. You know, the things that were once joyous and pleasurable um are are challenging now that's certainly how I would describe my relationship with particularly things like alcohol I, I found it more and more challenging I've found perhaps mm. make many more adjustments with it but to answer your question so in my other role as a, a performance coach you know we come up against habits all the time and the the brain is actually hardwired to create as many habits as possible I mean if you, if you stop to think which hand you brush your teeth with Zoe You'd probably have to stop and think yeah, about that's it. That's what we'd say. It's creatures of habit, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can do it with both, but my natural tendency, if I actually stop sure. to think about it, would, <laughs> sure, would be actually probably my right hand. But the brain shortcuts everything because it would melt if it if it didn't. Yeah. And so, shortcuts habits are actually one and the same thing. And and the best place to see shortcuts and habits popping up is in pleasure, mm. because we want pleasure quickly. We don't want to have to wait for it. And so um, I was saying to you earlier, one of the things that I found really useful when I'm working with clients is a, a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, and it's it's really simple. If you know this one way, you'll know it the other way. So if you want to make new habits, what you need to do is, number one, make them clear and obvious. So Can we start that, there then? Yeah. So let's start with there. So how do you make things clear and obvious? So that's if you want to make a new habit. Okay. If you, on the other hand, want to break a habit, so in the context like we're saying, maybe you would like to break the habit mm -hmm. or the cycle that you have with something like alcohol, you just do the opposite. So if if making a new habit okay. is about making it clear and obvious, breaking a habit is about making it invisible. Okay, talk me through that. We need to start the process of thinking, okay, so if you think about when you're in your 20s or, or even younger for some of us, when you first got introduced to alcohol, you know, it's there in front of you, isn't it? It's visually yeah. appealing. You walk into a party, it's there. Yeah. And it's a challenge, isn't it? In your teens, it's getting hold of it. It's that. And again, that sort of dopamine rush of you yeah. can get hold of the stuff. Yeah. 
is exactly. just a reward thing. Exactly. So the minute you've got hold of it and you're taking your first sip, this is red bush tea, not alcohol. <laughs> but the minute you've got hold of it and you're taking a sip, your habit center has already gone, let's just turn this into a habit because Amantha seems to be really enjoying that first sip. Yeah. And even then, you're conned, aren't you, at the beginning? Because yeah. I remember first trying alcohol thinking it was absolutely disgusting. But because you are told and getting the messages all around you, you keep plodding away, don't you, thinking, right, I need to learn how to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So if we wanted to change that script, right, by, right back in when we were in our 20s, yeah. what we would do is we'd make it invisible. So what we do is we don't actually look in that direction. We, we set up an opportunity for ourselves to succeed, which is as soon as I'm going to get there, I'm actually going to go and look for my friend, Rachel. OK. And that's the bit that you go, OK, now that's invisible to me. You're setting up something. You're, you're setting up something for yourself because you have a motivation, which is actually if you've already decided and I know we're going to talk about this, if you've already decided, OK, alcohol isn't good for me but actually mm -hmm. drinking soft drinks is better for me and remembering an evening and really being able to recount it and feel joyous about it. That's much more motivating for me. So I suppose that leads on to, <clears throat> I, I spoke about this week about that whole first time in social occasions where alcohol is going to be there. Um, and again, if you're trying things like this at home, clearing the visibility, so yeah. not having it in the house. Yes. It's trickier, isn't it, with lots of things because they are. Yes. So how, how do you? Well, it probably again, comes. You say it probably comes on to the second step, which is. Um, so in making it invisible, I know if I put it in my shed. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go to my shed. Probably around the time when I probably would normally be drinking a glass of wine. OK, so I've removed it it's harder. It's harder. It, I, I've now got to put some effort in. Okay, so you've broken that sub that conscious. Yeah, that's another thing, isn't it? It's um, that conscious drive, isn't it? Rather than just a subconscious habit thing. That if you've added another step in, yes, you are owning that habit more, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. I mean, some would argue if you don't even have it in the house at all, then you've removed a massive chunk of that issue altogether. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we did talk about you know you've got to be ready to, to do this you know and obviously with things like Christmas coming up I'm not suggesting for one minute that you just you know scoop all your bottles up and it's tipping them down mm. the sink but it might be about making it less in your line of sight where's where do those people have their alcohol mine sat on a cupboard in the lounge yeah so I've made it so easy for my I mean I literally could lean like that yeah and get my hand on a bottle but actually if I even moved that from there and put it in my dining room or my kitchen I have to now put that next step in of actually getting my backside off the sofa and that's a different part of the brain isn't it yeah, then, being yeah. which is like your coordination it's, it's that desire thing and it's like yeah. I have no desire to get up and go and get myself something so and it just all, breaks a little bit, doesn't it? Well, you're breaking that chain. You're weakening yeah. that habit. You're just weakening it. Of course, sometimes I will go, no, right, I am going to go and get a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. So, okay, then we have to think of how, how do we make it even, even easier for ourselves? Well, so what we've done there, by moving it, we've done the third step, which is we've made it harder. Okay. So naturally making something harder. Also, the last step is to, if you want to break a habit, make it unsatisfying. How often have you like, oh, you've thought about a glass of wine, the whole journey home, whole journey home, mm -hmm. knowing that I don't care to hell with that, that idea of not having as much alcohol, I need it today. <clears throat> you have a first sip and then you go, well, that wasn't great. You know, you've, you've, you've either given yourself a guilt trip, which I'm not advising, Mm. Or you've just, it's just not as satisfying as you thought it was going to be, which begs the whole question, what do you want from it? I think this is it, isn't it? You have to really, there's a lot of prep work in this. You do have to, and um, when I spoke to Lindsay, she was saying about a food diary and writing down, again, linking the two things rather than just in and either grazing or yeah. doing whichever habit. It's 
again, it's all sort of about breaking that chain, isn't it? So if you come in and write down, how am I actually feeling? What happened in my day? Yes. What could be driving this? Do I really want this? Um, just That's a really good a point. A bit more, isn't it? Really good point. And if you ask yourself, what's the first thing? Like you came into your house tonight, Zoe. If tonight was a typical night, what did you? Where did you go first in your house? T teapot. <laughs> right. And yeah. that's the point, isn't it? It's like we are so process driven in our own lives. Like normally, what I come and do will either go to the toilet, yeah, and straight into the kitchen. And I can absolutely yeah. guarantee you, I'm probably in a cupboard whilst the kettle's boiling. Yes. Yeah, and I, it's that, I, hope, I suppose it's that thing as well. I couldn't tell you, which is decaf tea, I have to say. Um, if you look back over the day, I couldn't accurately tell you my intake because it's just been done without me even thinking about it. Whereas if I had a little notebook and wrote down each time, yes. am I actually thirsty? Am I bored? Am I frustrated? Am I... What yes. What's the context behind your yes. behaviour? You know, is it just a habit on autopilot? What I find now, for example, is when I was um, wanting to not be so reliant on sugar, for example, I wouldn't mm -hmm. go in the kitchen because actually, like I said to you, I'm in the cupboard whilst the kettle's boiling. So I need to, I need certain snacks there because I've got a teenager at home. So yeah. it's there. OK, but it's about my discipline. So what I do instead now is I come to the I've got a bathroom upstairs in my house. Mm -hmm. I come and use the toilet up here. Which means it's easier for me to come into my office and sort myself. And I always have a glass of water in here. So actually, I've removed the need for me to be in the kitchen at all. And therefore, I don't have to face all of that, that cycle that usually happens down there. Yeah. I distract myself by coming upstairs. I know I've got water here because I keep one of those bottles of water in here. Yeah. And I don't really want to be having a cup of tea because if I have a cup of tea, I want a biscuit. And I think there's something as well, isn't there? I think this is, it links back to Kate's book. There's something that happens in menopause. Well, I see it frequently, that there's this almost seeking out of truth and the true me. And I don't want to be covered in all this stuff anymore. I want to know what is really me. And I think part of that, again, I see it very, very commonly, is an ability to sit with more uncomfortable feelings and observe them. Excellent point. Really excellent point. I mean, my childhood was very complex growing up. And when I think about four o'clock in the afternoon, it, it's all about emotional eating for me. Mm. Because my parents would always eat very late. I mean, we would be eating at dinner at about eight mm -hmm. o'clock at night and I don't, would ever, not... don't ever eat at a northerner's house I live with one and it's very strange you can't you can't do that <laughs> no no I mean I, I mean <laughs> my body resisted it massively but what I did instead was I would feel quite alone at four o'clock there'd be nobody in the house so I'd, I'd make myself practically a, a tea a dinner and what so what age are you talking so uh, throughout my whole yeah. teenage years at secondary school, you know, I would come in at yep. four o'clock, there would be nobody there. My mum was a nurse. She would either be in bed or would have got up and gone out. My dad didn't come home. I'm the middle child. So you can make, you, mm -hmm. can, you can imagine the sort of psychological complexities of that one if you want. But the reality was I used to feel quite alone and I would mm. sit and comfort eat. I would, I would like crisp sandwiches. Mm -hmm. So now I, I've recognised in myself, I haven't actually ever fully sat down and thought about that until quite recently, which is what's the whole thing about being in the kitchen at four o'clock? And I think this is, again, this comes up time and time and time again, um, because it's, and it, it can be, it can feel very frightening because uh, again, I think a lot of um, unresolved trauma will bubble to the surface in perimenopause. Um, obviously with the threat system, with hormones going. Definitely. And depending on what that is, um, again, I've spoken to, so we, we call it sort of the, the big box that you've carried around. You may not have even realized that you were carrying this big box around with you. And with some people, we sort of just 
almost acknowledge that the big box is there, but it's not the right time to go looking or it may never be the right time, but just knowing and acknowledging that that box is there is enough. And that might have driven that as you've identified that behavior at that time. If it, again, so if you weren't able to come to some sort of peace with that, um, then again, is it the time to go and have some support to with therapy to open that box? And this is, again, it's really tricky, isn't it, with the NHS at the moment really struggling. And it's, again, we'd always say sort of, ideally you don't, if depending what's in the big box, you, you, you do it with some care and compassion and probably professional support, but it's, it's something that, and I think it does come to this, everything is coming to the surface, isn't it, with these hormones? And it again, it doesn't really, it, I see these sort of transitions, whatever age your menopause has been, whatever, whether it's surgical, chemical, there's there seems to, there's a separate almost psychological transition isn't there that massive mass massively if I show my model of my brain which I show with my clients which is you know we're, you know we've got logic here this lovely great big yeah. orange logical center but at the back sort of here we've got the emotional center we've got your mm. amygdala there which is your fight flight freeze reflex and although you know you're not running from a tyrannosaurus rex things like loneliness unhappiness traumatic experiences in your childhood I will be held here mm. and we're already vulnerable as you say because of our hormonal changes and if there's unresolved stuff perimenopause will show it up mm. for sure mm. the, you know the amount of people that I see who, who come to me either professionally um, or via executive performance coaching or through perimenopause yeah. it's the same thing really what we're dealing with is you know when you think about what thoughts are, they're emotions plus feelings. And where do they come from? Well, here, not here. Yeah. So if we're ruminating on thoughts that then just become habitual, and that's really yeah. interesting, where you don't even know you're having those thoughts, but your body's reacting as though you are. Yes. You know, those that self-doubt, that anxiety, that uncertainty about where your life's going at this stage in midlife, all of those things, you know, am I good enough? You know, am I making a complete mess of my life? All of these things that we tend to be quite down on ourselves about. Mm. They're sort of layers. And I think in the second spring book, what they talk about is, you know, the things that happen in your, your, your younger formative years that are unresolved, they sort of get piled up upon with midlife mm. and everything else that's happening, raising a family, you know, doing your career, doing all of these things that we're juggling, all these balls that we're juggling. But beneath mm. that is still that layer that's unresolved. And what happens over time is it sort of w works its way to the top and it just sits there to the point that now you can't avoid it. And that's what it can feel like for, for a lot of people. Like I just sort of fill my life with more stuff to just to keep avoiding yeah. that thing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's just it's too much, it's, which is why yeah. the, the, so the things we to lean on. The, yes. yes, come back in again. And I think, again, it's, it is, but those things no longer work very well correct correct but then we do, because we've relied so heavily on them or we felt we've been coping it's like well what do you go to next and that's and I think the other thing is we've, we've been told that we rely on them haven't we mm. like all of these messages this is how you cope with this feeling you have alcohol or you have sugar or you exercise have yeah, some, some people can use exercise as a coping or strategy work. or work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Which is why burnout is such a such a such record levels right now because actually people's threshold it's no longer working. That's what burnout yeah. shows us, doesn't it? You know, you're numbing your pains, you're numbing your own pains by relying on alcohol. That doesn't work, and it might be prescriptive medicine and all of these sorts of things. But I guess what we wanted to say to people was to just notice that. And, and I love your idea of journaling, document. And journaling doesn't have to be a big deal. I know some of my clients... No, it's, oh. it's, it's, a, it's a little notepad, isn't it? Just it's, Yeah, like a post-it note to yourself or yeah. something on your phone. You know, whatever works for you. But it's about going, okay, I've been doing this for two weeks. Let me take a look at what I've been writing down. Right, yeah. okay. So what I'm writing down so I know is, yeah, that Wednesday <clears throat> evenings are yes. my fragile time. Yeah. So what could I 
Now I've done this first bit of the project, it is a project. Um, I've worked out where my vulnerable spots are. Are there now alternatives that I could try in place of that behavior? Definitely, definitely. And there are great apps like the Calm app, the free version is really, really good. It gets you to do a check-in. So, yeah. you know, give yourself the best chance of, you know, addressing it by doing, first of all, doing something different, you know, so if you're always in straight in and doing the children's tea, you know, we've got to make it work for you. Fine. You could do that. Then take your five minutes to go, okay, how am I? What yeah. do I need? Now, but even you can sort of alone, just where am I carrying questions. stress? Yeah. Where am I carrying yes. stress? What, what is it I, what am I feeling? Give it an, inten an intensity score, one yeah. to 10 know what good looks like for you you know and then it's about asking yourself what could be contributing to that i've had a really hellish day or got stuck in traffic on the way back and everything's an hour later now or you know i've forgotten something or i'm feeling anxious about something you start to get to know yourself mm. Mm. better in a way truthfully truthfully it's truthful you isn't it and think this yeah. is what as you say it just keeps bubbling to the surface yeah so where would you, so when you're speaking to people, is this, do you tend to, again, are we looking at, so, because part of this is quite individualized, isn't it? It's looking at what are your motivators, what are your barriers? But then there is also, I think, I mean, particularly in the last five, 10 years, there are lots and lots of support mechanisms out there, aren't they, to carry, are there particular ones that you gravitate towards? <laughs> I mean, we, we don't focus specifically on, you know, the alcohol necessarily, but what we say to people is, it's about actually looking at some of the habits in your life and utilizing them actually in different ways. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a concept called habit stacking. So let's say you want to, the, the brain isn't very good at coping with loss. Yeah. If you tell the brain that you're going to lose something, even if it's something that's a wanted loss, the brain, the, your brain doesn't react very well. And I often say to people, think of it like a seven-year-old and imagine telling the seven-year-old you can't have something. It's, it's sort that's of the, all the, they can think about. That's all they can think about. So what you do is you have to, like, if we imagine like they've got the toy, you don't want them to have it. You want to have a, something different. It's about how do you sure negotiate you around that? How do you just hand one over? And it's called habit stacking and it's brilliant. So, you know, say you are already doing something at dinner time when you would have wanted a glass of wine. The habit is dinner time. Now you can stack on a new habit, which mm -hmm. is I always pass. This is what I actually do. I always pour myself a very long glass of sparkling water with lemon in it. OK. And that somebody mentioned that just having choosing a nice glass, adding something to it so it looks nice. Yes. And so what I do with that then is now that's two re twofold because I've done the background work that we just talked about, really recognizing what it is mm -hmm. I'm doing. I've realized a short glass is not going to be good enough for me because that's going to be finished. But I'm then still in that same situation of I'm going to walk into my lounge and the alcohol sat there. Yeah. But what I do instead is I've got this long tumbler. I'm sipping it why either one of us is cooking the dinner I take it into dinner with me it will always still have some left and I physically walk with that because I'm enjoying yes. it so it's telling your brain that it's yeah. still and I'm now in the lounge with it and I did it yeah. for a whole month Zoe yeah and I honestly the more I did it the more I was like I'm really enjoying this I'm enjoying I'm feeling motivated because I, my whole reason for doing it was to be to feel healthier and I wanted to test it out to see what does it feel like yeah the only other time that I'd done that was when I was pregnant and I had a motivation for doing it then which was the same one I wanted to be healthy I think that also again because you need the so when you first start doing this it's um somebody came up somebody told me a fantastic phrase that you never re, you never wake up regretting not drinking the night before and I think it is taking that five minutes in the morning isn't it to say again a scan how do I feel and it might not be hugely different when you first change 
these habits, but how do I feel? And there's going to be a bit of a pat on the back. Ooh. I got through all these obstacles and here I am on another day. So it may be that it's tricky again, uh, that, but I did it. I did that day. And it's, Brilliant. again, I think it's, it's noting that, isn't it? Because we don't praise ourselves anywhere near enough. It's, it, it's not encouraged, is it? And I think it is that thing of actually, I did a pretty good thing. There were all of these things going on around me. Society everywhere else is pushing this on me and I stuck two fingers up to it and I did it. <laughs> exactly. It's celebrating the small steps for you. You know, valuing is you valuing you because, yeah. you know, I love that. I love that um, thing. You know, no one's coming to rescue you. No one's coming yeah. to save you because they're not. Yeah. So whatever unhappiness is in your life, you do ultimately have a choice about it. I think that's again. Let me look a bit careful with obviously with the box there, um, but I think with the little things like this, then yes, yeah. and you still have a choice not to open the box. Still, you can choose yeah. not to open the box, and that in itself is still an empowering choice. If yeah. if it's serving you, so yeah, I don't I don't mean that to sound trite because we all have a lot of challenges and we're all going to have yeah. significantly more challenges. Okay, and that comes back to the whole timing thing. If it's not the right time. Yeah, this is, again, this has been very careful, isn't it? It's, it's been very careful. You. you know, you'll know when it's right for you. I wasn't ready to unpack my stuff in my 30s and 40s, but I definitely mm. was as I approached my 50th, definitely. Mm. And I signposted to lots of people very close to me, I'm going to be doing something and I just need you to just all show up for me and to okay. be tolerant and to be kind. And if I say I'm not drinking, I'm not drinking um and it was no biggie but in my world it was quite a big thing for me to do that is, you know? no, so that's again you've prepared haven't you to yeah. take that another step into a, an environment that isn't fully under your control but you said look I'm trying this out I'd really appreciate it if you'd support me yeah and that stops those really annoying comments of oh you're not drinking tonight what's up with mm. you you know, and because and, you don't, that's all of that's unhelpful. So even ourselves, you know, we don't want to be too righteous about the fact that we haven't drunk for a period of time, because actually everyone comes at it in a different way, a different time when they're ready, you know, and if you tried it once and it didn't work, to be put off by that, it's probably mm. just something in your setup didn't help you to, to move it forward in the way that you wanted to. And and actually, if you're struggling consistently to do that, that probably is a good time to have someone help you, support you, yeah. do it, do it professionally. And I did have that help quite a lot a few years ago. Um, but like I say, in slices, very thin slices, I came to it at the point when I was absolutely ready. And I and think with that's things like that, you can still go back, can't you, and look at it. So a friend and I um, will do it slightly the opposite way when um, I was determined that I. I was going to I was going to master running and a friend and I we purchased leisure wear and we were going to do up to 5k and about half a mile in I don't know what I did to my calf muscle and we had to it was the, one of the busiest days round by the river so we oh, had no. to limp all the way on oh, no. <laughs> but I could go back and I could say right okay why didn't that go to plan yeah and I could say maybe it was the 19 year old trainers and maybe it was not doing any stretches beforehand. Um, so it's looking at that doesn't mean that that plan is off the table. Exactly. I just not prepared as much as I possibly needed to. And I think that's the thing, isn't it, with with social events, as you said, if it you could look at what point in the evening. What happened, what was said? what what did that mean to me so if it was somebody saying why aren't you joining in does that again echo something from and it's very often yes. from childhood isn't it yeah yeah so an, a critical parent yeah you know when we look at something like transactional analysis you know um that can be people talking down to you can be mm. people putting you in your place that 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 sometimes forces your child to pop up yeah. your childlike ego to pop up um but you're right it's about just noticing it and one thing actually you made me think there which was really helpful you know 
it's a bit like smoking you know I think there is evidence to show that if you do it with somebody you're more likely for that for that to actually pan out so having a buddy system you know yeah. people you know if you're faltering you know quick phone call or a pep talk from someone's so like no 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 no. okay you've had a rough day but remember look at all that you've done look how much you've achieved yeah. because you can hijack yourself with your own negative self-talk yeah and it can be quite quick can't it from someone yeah. else to come in and yeah someone again. said something at a party oh yeah no oh, yeah god who am i kidding why why am i even trying to do this yeah I, you know it's ridiculous what are people saying about me you know you can quickly yes. get into that sort of mindset whereas actually if you're like no okay if this happens I just need to send a text to somebody they're they're going to support me because you've done the setup yeah. and you know people aren't judging you those people share similar values to you they understand why you're doing it you're not looking for permission this is this is up to you this is your stuff um but yeah pick people who you know will be there for you and will you know step in when you need them and they'll give you that little gentle push to keep going and how do you, so again, once we've, I think clearing it for the first stage is, is the first set of hurdles, isn't it? And then it's, it's the, so that in a way is a little bit exciting um, yeah. because it's new. Um, so then how do you get over that excitement to the maintenance side of things? How do you then keep that? That's great. And so it can be things like you can get apps, which a tracking app. So I think in the, the Atomic Habits book under, under these show notes, I'll put something in. But there's actually apps you can get that actually show you a bit like Strava for running. You know, mm -hmm. you've consecutively run so many days. Brilliant. Here's a here's a sticker or something like that. And I know because even though we do that with children, you know, that part of your brain, that seven year old part of your brain loves to be rewarded. We yeah. like to go well done. That's that's brilliant. You know, I think um, we don't do anywhere near enough of that, do we? No, nowhere near enough of it. We're very hard on ourselves. And it comes back to that whole negativity bias of, you know, if, if someone says something negative to you or you say it to yourself, you need three positives to cancel it out. Mm. Mm. Most of us aren't getting anywhere near that level <laughs> of positivity. <laughs> And sometimes we're um, relying on it too externally as well. Yes, I was going to say it has to come from within, doesn't it? Which can feel very... Um, I remember one of my previous trainees um, talking about a gratitude journal. And I just looked at her and said, do you think I would ever do that? <laughs> and then you had to say three nice things to your partner. And I said, that's even less likely. <laughs> I didn't think I had gone completely mad. But... I think it it is. I I mean again, it's it it's what works for you, isn't it? So I have become much better at, I would probably say mindfulness. So I really appreciate being out in green space, even just on a dog walk with the hum of the M60, and it's that just stop and look and be. And those little snippets again, I have found more relevant. I would say through perimenopause, menopause. It, it just feels this need to ground and to earth and to strip yeah. back and be truthful. Absolutely. And um, so Stephen Peters, Professor Stephen Peters wrote um, the world bestseller, The Chimp Paradox, which so yeah. many people have heard of. And, and I sometimes think of it like this. If you think of that seven year old part of yourself that wants stuff, wants it, wants what all, all the things that are construed as maybe not helpful habits, wants all of those things, actually what you can give instead is a mm. truth yeah give yourself three truths about yourself you know i was really helpful to somebody today or i was really kind i was really tolerant today you know give yourself three truths about you that you would be happy to hold and your chimp is very good at going oh well done the amount that's really pleased with me well done well done i don't need to kick off now you know, and it, it is honestly like that. It's very, very powerful. But it's hard to, we did a, um, ages ago, um, that there was a group of trainees who are sort of fairly recently qualified and they did these sessions just more from, for, um, just because there was, it was in your first year. So they just organized some extra training where that group stayed together. And one of the exercises was a trophy cabinet. And so this is a group of, I would say fairly intelligent people. 
and you had to big piece of paper you had to draw a trophy cabinet and you had to put your trophies in it took I would say an hour before anybody would mm. be nice about themselves in that cabinet and it was this big because yeah. I think again you're taught that that is showing off aren't you and it's not it is so can I just do a little example for you which might be quite helpful for people okay yeah. so if I said to you Zoe can you think of somebody who you really admire yes can you think of that person in your head okay you don't need to say yeah. who they are okay can you give me three words to describe that person in terms of either how they make you feel what you like about them so that'd be truthful genuine honest right this may come as no surprise but you are actually describing yourself also in that because what happens is because we are hardwired to find it uncomfortable and difficult it's, it's easier to talk about other people isn't it That's and what weird. we know is that we send out signals to people like an invisible radar we actually project our, our values out woodley so if i said to you you know what do you enjoy about your work or what do, you about, what do you enjoy about working with your colleagues? You'd actually be describing yourself. And that's the gift. So if you are struggling at all that's, to say kind things about yourself, <laughs> ask yourself. I've not come across that one. It's so powerful, yeah. though. It's really powerful because it instantly affects your neurology. And when we affect our neurology, our brain starts to talk to our gut. We release that yeah. GABA neurotransmitter. All is well in the world you've calmed down your stress response and the likelihood of you reaching for things. So I would encourage people, think of someone you like spending time with and, and mm -hmm. challenge yourself to think of a different person each time. Like I had lunch yeah. with um, Michelle Griffith Robinson today, who's actually an Olympian, former Olympian. Yeah. Um, we happened to realize we live literally 10 minutes away from each other. <laughs> and we sat and had lunch today and I just, if you ask me, you know, what I enjoyed about that lunch, I enjoyed the honesty, the openness, the laughs, the yeah. connection. Hang on a minute. I'm just describing yes. all the things about myself. Yeah. And so actually I enjoy connection. I've enjoyed laughing. I've enjoyed sharing. It, it's about putting I in front of each of those things then, because the minute you identify with someone, that's where you reclaimed your power. If you put I in front of anything, I, you know, yeah. I, I, you just feel differently. Yeah. And it, that gets, it, it just gets taken away from you, doesn't it? At an early age, I was, um, I think it's Glennon Doyle in her book said that, um, particularly as a female, you start, you're most connected to your true self at the age of nine. Apologize if it's not in that book, but I've read it somewhere. Yeah. And then that gets, chipped away and chipped away and it only returns I think or starts to return in menopause where and this is what we want it's going back to actually I am this I am that I am a good person to be around I, I am doing well because there's been so many things that have over the years isn't it you can see from yes. very early on you're not wearing the right things, you're not being the right thing, you're too fat, you're too thin, you do this, you do that. So it's like you end up in this stage carrying, carrying, carrying. And I think there is just this sense of, well, this ain't working. Let's yeah. just start digging down and looking underneath it all. And I think Absolutely. this is where not just the alcohol and sugar, is it the no, same? No. It's, it's so much it's so much more than that you know it could be the reliance on wearing the same clothes if i had a pound for every time someone going through menopause said to me i stopped wearing color i have it said to me so often usually when i'm really? wearing my red suit which i wear when i'm talking about menopause in businesses people say oh i used to love that color people say i've just no. sort of shrunk into my wardrobe if i open my wardrobe it's all brown black gray. honestly and 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 what you've said is so true something that can help you know Pick a time point in your life somewhere between seven and 12 mm. where you can hold a picture of yourself. I mean, I can see one instantly. In fact, I went one step further and put a picture of myself at a, as, as a, a nine year old on my mm. landing. So when I walk past it, I see her. I've actually manifested what that part of me looks like. So yeah. 
when I say to my clients, you're actually never on your own. Your unconscious mind is around a seven to 10 version of you. And she's the bit that's just a bit jittery. She's the bit of you that's just a bit unsafe. She's the bit of you that's desperately trying to get your attention to say, I'm fed up wearing black or brown. Can we have a bit of fun in a different sort of way? You know, that intuition is so powerful. And you're so right, Zoe. We sort of dispense with that and and out with it when all our dreams and hopes and ambitions for that time in our life. And, And menopause sometimes can bring it all back up to the surface all that unresolved stuff and it doesn't have to be necessarily traumatic it could be just I wish I'd have done something else yeah. with my life or yeah. I didn't think it was going to be like this or I wanted so much more by the time I'd got to this stage in my life so when you sort of feel like every person every bit that you're describing is not you mm. but it's a part of you that needs nurturing and caring for and loving and cherishing actually help think you even, to reclaim yourself a little bit that, I think that's why Karen Arthur's um, blog is so powerful isn't it with the where you're happy and it was I'm not going to reference to anyone else today I'll if I want to put on a ball gown I'll put on a ball gown yeah brilliant even brilliant. if I'm just putting it around the house because I'm not quite there to wear it down the high street exactly it's exactly still, sending me a message that this is what I choose to wear today this is who I choose to be and that's okay yes and it can start small I stopped wearing red 10 years ago more than 10 years ago I was known in the pharmaceutical industry certainly where I worked as as the lady who wore the red suit I hadn't worn red for more than a decade completely went into grey invisible I think I was just Mm. trying to make myself invisible Mm. but now so if people see me wearing red I reclaimed my color but you know what I started with a mobile phone case first of all yeah yeah well this was because I messaged Karen because it was it that that itself I found really quite unsettling because I've been somebody that from being young generally tries to hide under the table and as you say be invisible So the idea of even having a photo taken wearing something that I liked was really uncomfortable. Yeah. So that, yeah. And it was sort of, actually, I've done it and I love this coat and I love this skirt and I'm out there. Yeah, fabulous. And yeah. So it's, it's, again, it's, it's something that seems very little for somebody else can be quite a so again, it's what you are able to do, isn't it? It's what you are able to change and it's the pace that you are able to do this at. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And if you can just top up your own emotional bank account, shall we say, yeah. by saying, you know, I'm happy that I showed up today. Yeah. I'm happy. I'm, I'm really happy. I'm out of bed and I've, you know, put myself in some sort of order or, or I'm happy that I just spoke nicely or respectfully to everybody, you know. Yeah. give yourself reasons to just be okay with you and even that as you say that actual that's that sh- I, I met a somatic trauma therapist last week because yeah. that's something that's really and it is just holding yourself holding yourself yeah. again yeah do you know what you're a good egg yeah we need a lot more of this don't we yeah it actually makes me feel really emotional to say that because actually you know that there's a scarcity in my own life of actually feeling that but what I've come to realize is I can give that to myself anyway because as they yeah. say happiness is an inside job mostly you know if you can create those feelings internally of you it just ripples out to other people and I think that's why the menopause community is so great I think unconsciously we all recognize we are pretty much all in the same boat yeah yeah and it is that radar isn't it where you keep saying yeah office just spot somebody you don't even have to talk hormones it's just would you like a cup of tea yeah are you all right yeah yeah because I'm you know because a completely stranger can make you feel amazing yeah um but you can also do that for yourself so remember whatever you give out top back up yourself because then you're ready to go again um and it might just be lying in bed going do you know what I'm really glad that I'm now about to go into a restorative phase also known as sleep (laughs) <laughs> you know, I'm I'm just going to I'm just going to sleep and I'm going to restore and I'm going to get up and do it all again tomorrow. Yeah. You know, but I think it is I think most of this, you know, when I first started speaking to you, I said it's actually often it's not so much about the alcohol. It's 
what's driving those behaviors yeah. beneath it and most often in not in perimenopause it's we either don't feel good enough or we feel unfulfilled in some way or something that's just not been and needs haven't been met met yeah and i think that's again another thing that creeps up isn't it it's actually it's it's time my needs were met i am a valid person as well as all the 500 other people in my life that i'm looking after how about me yeah and you're absolutely right and it's okay to have that conversation outside of what normally happens is when we're raging <laughs> yes yeah, so i'm not going to tell you my, <laughs> was, my spectacular one was right at the beginning of my perimenopause was you know the toilet roll middles oh god yes i lost it went into a how come only somebody with a vagina can put these in the recycling if I ever disappear, they'll be able to find me because it's only my DNA on the broom handle. I just raged for about half an hour. But that was because, again, and I always sort of say, look at what's at the look at what lit the mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. Because there was a genuine reason for that. And there was an unfairness within the house of right. who doing what. Yeah. And so things like your values will usually be the touch paper. And remember, yes. a value is something you can't pick up. So money is not a value, but if I love hearts, but a value is something you can't pick up. So fairness, trust, yes. loyalty, respect. Yes. Those are the things we start reacting to much more in perimenopause. We do. We do. <laughs> and, and so it's that. Actually, that's the first thing when I work with menopausers, we look at their purpose in life and what your values are. We actually don't yes. really talk about this. We talk about you. Yeah. What are you, what's your reason for being here on planet Earth this lifetime? What are you here to do? And how's it going so far? And what's working for you? What's not working for you? People say to me, they love the fact that they feel it's so indulgent, but it's not really. No. Talking and 100%, you are the priority. And we just need to get back to doing that a little bit, a little bit every day yeah. for ourselves and not giving ourselves yeah. a hard time on the days that we miss it and not feeling the need to have to do double the next day. Yeah. It's about when you can do, and when you can't, don't sweat Rest. the small stuff. Rest. Yes. 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 I think that's another thing I have to try. And again, it's a big one, isn't it? Of trying to come off the hamster wheel without fearing that the world will collapse. And that's a whole other topic. A whole other topic. <laughs> but you know what? But, but this, I think, I think will, I think people will want to know more, more about this. So what, what we could do is. Um, Certainly we'll put some resources in the, mm -hmm. in the show notes because this is going to be on YouTube and people on Instagram can then take a look. But if we spot anything in the meantime, we'll just list it there. Um, but if anyone else has got any resources yeah. that they know, please let us know because it's not just a one-stop shop to topic, I think. I think this no, is sure. something that we're going to need to keep revisiting for people as they come into it, go out of it. And sharing mm. really is the best way because when people mm. find what works for them, but I think if we could up the, the kindness quota in over the winter definitely. months, I think yes. we do too badly. Yeah, it's no, definitely, definitely. Um, I think it's, it's been nice actually in I was saying to um, Maureen Anderson that it's, I don't know whether it's just my perception, but around Manchester, people seem to be just that kindness level um Amazing. have gone up so just letting people cross the road and only as i say it's, it's, i don't know whether it's me wishing it um i'm hoping it's true but it does feel slightly more gentle than it has done previously um, and that in itself which is another whole topic, topic of conversation is manifesting you know do put out there what you want yeah do put out that those positive intentions in the world. If you, I'm not a great journaler, but I'm very good at putting manifestations. I, I definitely put an order out every day when I'm out in green spaces and say what I want to happen in the world. And mostly, you know, stuff is okay. And even if it isn't, I did my bit, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, you know, there's a reason to feel good about that, you know? And, yeah. and, and start the day in some positive way even if you can just look in the mirror or not look in the mirror and just give you well just a smile a smile inwardly which okay. doesn't even have to appear as a smile <laughs> on your face because mirrors aren't great i'm not great with mirrors but you know just knowing that there's goodness inside of you that you could project out 
is an amazing way to start the day. So why don't we all try, try, try that and see? But um, so thank you, Zoe. We sort of we sort of just few had a few things, haven't we? Yes, yeah, so we covered to... covered a few things. Would you like to summarise? Because you're very good at summarising, and I'll, and I'll I'll fill in anything anything. So we asked the question about change. Time for change. Time so I for think, change. Yeah, what we've covered really is that it's there is very often this new curiosity isn't it and it's to sit with it and I think your body and your brain very often tell you what you need to do we're just adept at ignoring it so it's it's having more time to just sit and listen and be curious and big up yourself because again we don't do that anywhere near enough so I think that's a really good starting point for change and then yeah. we've picked exactly. up on some tactics as well haven't we exactly exactly and you know I do love that whole thing of you can only do you yeah. so no, not worrying about the fact if everybody else seems to be smashing it winning their, their goals and you know we you know we can't all be like that at well that just level. again I've GP'd for 20 years they're not <laughs> no, no 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 thank you yes you know okay. they might look like they are yeah. and social media they're might not. be very beguiling people aren't we, we actually when you break it all down we're pretty much quite similar in that you mm. know we, we've all got struggles we've all got stuff we're trying to deal with we've all got stuff we're brave facing mm. but actually you know start with you because yeah. you are the most important person so I, I love that and so yeah when you realized it is time to change just make sure you've got that prep level done that yes. prep stage done have a buddy if you can have people yes. that will support you and take it steady be kind yes. to yourself yeah that's been brilliant thank you zoe that's a lovely conversation to have had on a on a monday afternoon that's set us up for the week so that's brilliant but um yes, thank yeah, you. any questions or, at, at all people can come back to us and how can people be in touch with you just to remind people or how can people follow you and know more about you um, I am mainly I'm, I'm not hugely good at LinkedIn etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so it's mainly Instagram Manchester menopause hive yeah no brilliant and what Zoe doesn't know about this. menopause isn't probably not worth knowing she's absolutely brilliant and um, so we'll put those links in too but for now Zoe thank you so much for your time thank you take care